You're listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. Fiction and fiction is reality. Now, here's your host, Rob McConnell. Welcome back, everyone. This is the Exxon. I am Rob McConnell. We're coming to you live from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, on the Exxon Broadcast Network, Talkstar Radio Network, and in Europe on Radio X. Worldwide toll free 800 610 7035. Email exxon at exxonradiotv.com. On all social media sites, Exxon Radio TV. And if you'd like to listen to the X Zone, 724-365, or just the broadcast from 8 p.m. until midnight, Monday through Friday, just go to www.exxoneradiotv.com. My guest this hour is Charles Chuck Stansberg, and uh, he is a star team member for MUFON, a field investigator, Texas State Section 12 director, and on the case assistance group team with 23 countries, I'm sorry, 23 counties in his charge. Um, He's also the interim state director of Idaho until they get their own. And the website that we are promoting tonight is MUFON.com. And as everyone knows, MUFON is the mutual UFO network. And Chuck, welcome back to the X-Zone. Busy times these days for uh, MUFON? Oh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yes, uh, we've been having uh, quite a few sightings uh, coming up. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've got uh, about five or six cases sitting right here on my desk. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we we get quite a few actually, and we kind of disperse them around mm-hmm. with, uh, uh, field investigators as well. Chuck, uh, what got you involved in MUFON? Uh, did you have your own experience? Um, yeah, I had my own experience, but um, I had my own group here in Texas for maybe um, six, seven months or so. It started kind of falling apart, and I kind of tried to contact MUFON, and there was a little bit of a iffy part going on there, and... Uh, it got straightened up real quick, and uh, five years ago, as a matter of fact, I uh, joined MUFON, mm-hmm. and uh, 
within two weeks of being a member of MUFON, I was promoted basically as a state state section director. And uh, at the time, I only had nine counties, but uh, things changed. So I got 23, 23 counties now in my charge. And uh, what really got me started basically was way back when I was in high school. And that kind of really got my interest in. From there on, it got escalated. Hmm. Um, are UFO sightings up? Are they down? Or are they staying basically the same as far as you know? As far as I know right now, we're having more than normal. Um, say, for instance, the, uh, the U.S. average is right around 500 and something a month. Wow. Uh, sometimes it'll get up to about six, 700. Um, in Texas, the state of Texas will average roughly around 52, 53 a month. And right now it's sitting at about 67, 66. Um, and uh, some, of these, some of these cases are like, for instance, uh, I've got one sitting here that goes all the way back to 1992. Mm-hmm. And I have one that goes back to, to 1970-something. And um, people are just figuring out, I guess, MUFON is here. Let me go ahead and re- report this sighting, even though it took, you know, it was way back when. We call that a uh, historical case uh, because it's already long, long lost in uh, uh, some of the information that we might try to get from Local authorities, we can't get it because they don't have any information about it. Um, or it's not in the newspaper or anything like this. So that's what we search for. Uh, we search all the different uh, uh, type of uh, radio stations, uh, TV, uh, uh, and, and, and authority, the authorities, uh, such as Highway Patrol, the uh, River Police Department. Right. Uh, sheriff's offices, even the Air Force and, and, and Navy Air, 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 Navy Air uh, stations and such, which I do, I, I do a lot of uh, calling them and uh, we don't know what you're talking about, you know, this kind of thing. Sure. Stand by, uh, Chuck. You and I have to take a brief break. Exo Nation. Chuck. Stansberg is our special guest. We're talking to Chuck. He is the MUFON State Director for Section 12. He's a member of the STAR team, a CAG member, and a field investigator. If you'd like to report a UFO, or if you'd like more information on MUFON, their main website is www.mufon.com. We'll be back on the other side of this break as we continue investigating the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology right here in the X-Zone with yours truly, Rob McConnell. Don't go away. Afterlife expert Roberta Grimes was the first one to say that dying can be fun. Now her best-selling book, The Fun of Dying, is available in stores worldwide. So if you wonder whether death ends life, how it feels to die, or what heaven might be like, The Fun of Dying was written for you. And if you have always been afraid of death, or if you worry that your life has no meaning, let The Fun of Dying ease your fears and bring new meaning to your life. Nothing said in The Fun of Dying is based on the teachings of any religion. Instead, Roberta draws on evidence to explain how death happens, how it feels, and what comes next. A lot of the best death-related evidence was produced in the first half of the 20th century. When it is put together with recent discoveries, it tells a consistent and amazing story. Roberta Grimes blogs and answers questions at robertagrimes.com. Her wonderful book, The Fun of Dying, is available on Amazon and at stores worldwide wherever books are sold. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. While science pursues fact, magic accesses the quantum level, bridging random facts to form truth. As long as science and magic remain separate and polarized, the truth cannot be known. 
I'm Wilda Wiecka. Join me on the Science of Magic radio program dedicated to unification and evolution of consciousness. During each episode, I'll be speaking with experienced and respected scientists and mystics. From astrologers to astronomers, from medical doctors to shaman, the scientific method to dowsing and intuition, we will weave together information from seemingly divergent practices to promote unity and enlightenment. Join me, Wilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic right here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. For more information, visit www.thescienceofmagic.net. Star began to demonstrate a metaphysical connection to the spirit world as a little girl. Her family noticed the connection, but it was a great-grandmother who told the family that Linnea was indeed gifted. The great-grandmother, who was also gifted, felt that Linnea had indeed inherited these attributes. It has been noticed that oftentimes, such things are passed down through the generations. Linnea was also born with a call, a thin white membrane across a newborn's face. Legend has it that if the baby is born with this call, the child will have second sight, or what we call psychic abilities. Linnea Starr does past, present, and future, and has the gift of prophecy. It is written within scriptures that if you were able to give factual information and prophecies indeed come true, the gift indeed comes from the divine realm. Linnea Starr does large interactive groups as well as private gatherings. For more information on Linnea Star or to contact Linnea for a one-on-one consultation, visit her website at www.linneastar.com. That's www.l-i-n-n-e-a-s-t-a-r.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Welcome back, everyone. Chuck uh, Stansberg is my special guest. He is the MUFON State Section 12 Director, Star Team Member, CAG member, and a field investigator. For more information about MUFON, or if you'd like to join MUFON, their website is www.mufon.com. Uh, Exo Nation, uh, when uh, Chuck sent me the information uh, that we asked him for the show, there was an update that caught my attention, and I was asking Chuck about it when we were on the break. Here's the update. I have been on board a battleship in brackets UFO a few times as a guest, then as a member of the crew. I am what you call a lieutenant in our world, and with a crew of seven. The crew is half ET, vegans, and reptilian, and the others are human. I do go up at least once a week at a time, and sometimes every two weeks for about two to three days. I also had my DNA taken, and I now have a hybrid daughter, and she is four years old. Her name is Starlight and is beautiful. She stays with her mother on their planet, and I do visit uh, there now and then, and they do come to the ship, and I am uh, the ship that I am on to see me before we head out to the war zone. I really enjoy what I do here on Earth, investigating sightings, abductions, and mutilations. I have been... About uh, it has been about 26 years now. 26 years now that I have been involved with ufology. Tell me about this battleship. <laughs> this battleship is massive. Um, <clears throat> how big? How big would you commander, say the? Tell how big the is the commander of it? Is is his name is Ferric, and uh, they are reptilian. They're, they're vegans, and. Uh, what got my interest was on that part uh, when I was introduced to him uh-huh. from a friend of mine that is a contactee. And uh, so, therefore, 
I became a contactee as well. And uh, they knew that, uh, they, they found out that uh, I was uh, in the military at one time here on Earth. And uh, they wanted to know what kind of big guns or small guns, whatever the case may be, that I have uh, dealt with. Mm-hmm. And I told them, and uh, they decided to, uh, once they once they became focused on me and, and my uh, trust, you might say, and their trust, everything started working pretty good, and they assigned a trainer to have me on the guns, and uh, it went from there, and, and I kind of enjoyed it. The trainers usually up on board ship is a female, and uh, she she uh, trained me very well, and uh, but as far as the ship is, it has separate quarters, and you have, I think, if I'm not wrong, um, there is, I believe, seven or eight different types of beings, including humans, on board, um, if I'm not mistaken, Sarek. And he says, yes, you are right. So he's telepathically talking to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, yes, um, they have their own quarters and they have their own types of food, per se. You might, I don't know some of that, what they are, but I don't want to know some of them. <laughs> but uh, we have uh, our own food as far as uh, we have a, a big area for ourselves. And... Uh, in, in the middle is where the food comes out and everybody comes together and eats and stuff, you know, on different uh, shifts and stuff. Um, this ship has artificial uh, artificial gravity, and it's not as heavy as Earth is. Uh, so if you, you got to kind of watch how you step, let's put it that way. And you know, if you just normal walk, which is good, and if you try to run, then you might be going down on your face or something because you mean going quite a ways uh, but uh, other than that it, it's pretty good um, we do go out I mean as far as the ship itself it can handle up to 500,000 and uh, it's got uh, dirt guns on all sides um like I said, it's, a com- it's one of the command ships with smaller ships that go with it. Um, there is a, what they call, a, what I would call a flagship, like we would with our military. Right. Um, I call it a flagship, and it's uh, a little bit bigger than what his is. Um, and this is what he... Uh, Galactic alliances. Uh, they have their meetings and they make sure that everything's fine in our galaxy, and that's what we're protecting: is our galaxy, not only just Earth, but the galaxy itself. Charles, one, Chuck, Earth. you, Chuck, you were saying five hundred thousand before. Were you talking about five hundred thousand people on board this ship? Yes. Wow, how big is the ship? It's, huge, believe me. Um, I can't really say how big, but I, if you take one of the smaller states, um, well, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, here you have the city of Newton, uh, I would say New York with, with, with how many million people. Mm-hmm. Bring that down to 500,000 and you may have a ship. Right there. Wow. Okay, about that big as far as where, where Manhattan is. So where does the ship stay? Does it stay within Earth, Earth orbit? Does it stay on the far side of the moon? Does it stay somewhere uh, within our, our solar system? It stays pretty much in our solar system, but it, 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 you know, the closest part it comes to us as far as our area uh, maybe Pluto or maybe 
one more up. But uh, other than that, they had smaller ships to use to come and get what we call our food, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. uh, um, but they, they they tour, or I should say, they they, they go around the galaxy itself on patrol on a constant basis. Um, the only time they, they stop is to get uh, nourishment, um, you know, such as water and, and whatever kind of drinks that mm-hmm. these other beings make. And they also go to other planets uh, of, from the beings that are on there and to get their type of food and stuff and bring it on board. Uh, and, and the question that was always asked me of what do you eat up there? Well, what we eat is just like hamburgers, steaks, eggs and bacon, you know, just a normal thing right. we could have here on Earth. Because we do have people that go on board a smaller ship mm-hmm. and they are brought to Earth on, as a matter of fact, there's like uh, a dozen ships and they all land on different parts of the planet to pick up food for the certain type of people that are on there. Um, the Asian, uh, uh, you know, American, Mexican, doesn't matter. So everything is caught up and brought up up there, and we're good for probably, I don't know, a couple months. What's the longest you have stayed aboard the ship on patrol? Uh, six days. Six days? Yeah. But when they brought me back, it was like, hours after they picked me up so I was gone for that time mm-hmm. and they brought me back on the time period that they pulled me up uh, when you're gone for these six days um, how do how do you explain your your disappearance or you're not being around for six days well let me put it this way okay my wife, when my wife comes in and she doesn't see me there. She goes, okay, I know where he is. <laughs> and then she goes back to the room. And then uh, the rest of the uh, plane here, my son-in-law, my daughter, they all know the same thing. That uh, if, I'm, uh, if I'm not here, then they know where I'm at. Tell me about your four-year-old daughter. Uh, what was her name? Starlight. Starlight, yes. Uh, she's a beautiful young lady, mm-hmm. and uh, she likes to play with uh, some of the uh, earthly, earthly toys and everything, uh, which is good. Uh, she's learning the English language as well as her own, and uh, the planet is like uh, I think about it's on the other side. It's on the other side of the Pleiades star system, and so it's in our it's in our galaxy, and. I go there once in a while. It's a beautiful planet. And it's, it's just gorgeous. And uh, what they did was they took DNA from me. And evidently, I don't know how they, you know, impregnate their their kind. Mm-hmm. But uh, evidently they did. And this, the mother, they're like in the gray, the gray part or the gray series of aliens, if you will. But they're tall. She's like about eight foot, and uh, she's kind of pretty herself, you know, from, from what what she is as far as uh, being an uh, alien. Right. You know. And uh, she's kind of pretty. And uh, we go to the planet now and again to have our little get together and everything. And I go back, and it's you know, that's how I got the. Uh, it was a big surprise actually, because. This was like uh, a year ago, and I was on board, and we got onto a smaller ship because mm-hmm. we were close to there, and we got on a smaller ship and went to, our, went to the planet, and, and we landed and got out. We then we sat down and I was talking a little bit, and we went outside, and uh, when we went outside in the back. Everybody was standing around. All right, Charles, we're going to have a little bit of a cliffhanger here because I have to take my news break at the bottom of the hour. Thanks so much for joining us, Charles, and for sharing this fascinating story. Exonation, my guest this hour is Charles Stansberg. 
He is with MUFON. He is a MUFON State Section Director. He is also a member of the STAR team, the CAG members, and a field investigator. For more information on MUFON, www.mufon.com. And uh, Charles and Chuck and I will be back on the other side of this break. Don't go away. Wouldn't you love to know the secret to everything? Well then, meet Dr. Kimberly McGeorge and her cutting-edge breakthrough knowledge that combines science with possibility. Dr. Kimberly brings real-life answers and healing to those open to alternative solutions. She teaches solution-based programs and classes that will change all areas of your life forever. Specializing in conscious creation, intuitive readings, and energy medicine, you can rapidly shift health, relationships, business, and money and abundance challenges quickly. Receive her best-selling book, Secret to Everything, at no cost by going to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone. That's right. Transformation can start now. Just go to secrettoeverything.com forward slash X zone and receive Dr. Kimberly's book for free. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Thomas Jefferson was a Burgess of 27 when he met Martha Whale Skelton, a 22-year-old widowed heiress who was fondly called Patty by her family. They were married on January the 1st, 1772, and they took up residence in a cabin on the building site on top of a Virginia mountain that Thomas had named Monticello. As Thomas and Patty slowly built their first version of the great house at Monticello, the Revolutionary War was heating up. Patty, with difficulty, bore five children, but only two girls survived. Thomas's political career developed to the point where he was often away from home, but after he authored and signed the Declaration of Independence in Philadelphia, he resolved never again to leave his wife. He was elected the governor of Virginia, just as that state became the revolution's last battleground. The Revolutionary War ended in 1781, and Thomas gladly retired altogether to my family, my farm, and my books. But Patty continued to want to bear her treasured husband a son, and late in the summer of 1782, she died of kidney failure at the age of 33, four months after having borne yet another girl. Thomas was so devastated by her death that he never remarried. He mourned her for the rest of his life, even as he helped to frame the peace in France and then became the first Secretary of State, the second Vice President, and the third President of the United States. This story is true. Thomas Jefferson was such an obsessive letter writer and record keeper that we know where he was and what he was doing nearly every day of his adult life. Every significant thing he says in My Thomas comes from his contemporary writings. My Thomas by Roberta Grimes is now available at Barnes & Noble, Costco, Target, Books A Million, Hudson Booksellers, Kmart, Walmart, Sam's Club, Walgreens, CVS, and online at Amazon.com. You can visit Roberta Grimes online at www.robertagrimes.com. <laughs> The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State certified occupational school training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com
Unwilling to be the government's deadly assassin, gifted psychic Kahara Mitchell went AWOL and ended up buried under rubble in the wake of a great tsunami. She regained consciousness far from Earth on the medical ship of a Dagaronian intergalactic fleet. Has she been rescued or abducted by aliens? The Chalice of Carrie, Kahira O'Donnell's latest paranormal science fiction romance, is the passionate story of an Earth woman and her destined mates, twin kings from another galaxy. Kahara uses her gifts fighting alongside Lords Rom and Ra in a war that will determine the destiny of galaxies. The Chalice of Kari by Kahira O'Donnell is now available at kahiraodonnell.com or at amazon.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. What Happened in Benghazi is revealed by Nicholas Genix, author of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. He informs the American people that President Obama deceived them by advocating a strong foreign policy prior to the 2012 presidential election, and Hillary Clinton supported this deception. As the title infers, there is a connection between Obama, Islam, and Benghazi. Ample evidence informs Americans that Obama's early indoctrination in the Quran developed an infinity for Islam, why the Quran is the source of discontent in many countries, and why the Obama foreign policy deception led to poor military action and caused the loss of American lives in Benghazi. Genix provides 36 questions for the Select Committee on Benghazi to validate if Americans are justified to mistrust President Obama and Hillary Clinton. An overview of Obama, Islam, and Benghazi is presented on the website www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Annie Callahan, dedicated to negotiating a position for Earth within the Dagaronian Coalition, had trained for three years to become an Earth ambassador. Yet, the very eve of her arrival at the capital ruling planet, she is claimed as destined mate to an oversized, mating maddened vamp who swears he will never release her. Lord Astaran, king of the Macian sector, has waited over 900 years for his destined mate, Having found her as an alpha vamp, he is unable to relinquish Annie, virtually holding her hostage until he can claim her. Yet Macians cannot survive without their mate's love. How could he strip her of her citizenship, her ambassadorship, and her freedom and expect to win her heart? With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is the latest book in this exciting series, The Daggeronian Chronicles, guaranteed to keep readers coming back for more. With All That I Am by Kahira O'Donnell is available on Amazon.com and KahiraO'Donnell.com. Listening to the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. Radio's authority on the world of the paranormal and the science of parapsychology. Celebrating 25 years of broadcasting. Broadcasting around the world and to the great beyond. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, Chuck Stanberg's our special guest. Uh, he is with MUFON. He is just a second here. Uh, let me see. MUFON State Section 12 Director, Star Team Member, CAG Member, and a Field Investigator. For more information on MUFON, visit www.mufon.com. Now, before we went to the, uh, the news at the bottom of the hour, Chuck, you and I were just starting to talk about your daughter, who, with her mom lives on the other side of of the of the Pleiades or of Syrians? Pleiades. Pleiades. Right. And uh, you get to see her once in a while, and she 
she is she is your daughter through DNA, right? Yes. Okay, and I, during the break, I was asking you what it's like only to see your daughter once in a while, and you, you know, it's it's a long way away. Uh, from the time you leave your home to get on the smaller ship to get to the bigger ship to the time you get to see your daughter, what is the period of time? Well, uh, from from here, um, they make sure I'm asleep. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, at least I try to be. Sometimes I'm awake when they go to pick me up and, and there's a grunt next to me, uh, uh, you know, like that. And uh, I say, sorry about that. Next thing you know, I'm on board ship. Now, the ship that I, I go on the first place is a smaller one. So we can go up to the main main uh, ship itself, the mother ship. Mm-hmm. And once we get on board there, then we go uh, towards the uh, on the other side of the Pleiades. It only takes about uh, the way they the way they do it. it it's, they, they bend time and, and uh, um, space, uh, time and space, and uh, it only takes maybe uh, um, about an hour to get there. And uh, once we're there, we slow down, and then we go on another smaller ship and then land on the planet. And uh, have our fun and enjoy the, enjoy the, uh, my daughter, she's very beautiful. But like I said, it was like a surprise to me. Mm-hmm. I first went there and, uh, about it, and I saw her when they, when they came out with her, and uh, myself and a few others were standing around. And... Uh, and they, they brought her out there. And I said, oh, she's beautiful. Who is she? And all of them, there's like four or five of them. They said, yours. Oh, my gosh. I said, what? <laughs> so they, they explained to me what they did. They just took my DNA and uh, impregnated uh, her mother. And, and uh, she come out here, and there she is. She's beautiful. Her mother is eight foot tall, or thereabouts. How tall is your daughter, Starlight, at the age of four? Uh, she's about, uh, let's see, about three foot, four foot. Wow. She's going to be a big girl. Yeah, she's going to be kind of tall, I think. <laughs> <laughs> What's their planet like? What is, their, what is the name of their planet? You know, I never found out what okay. the name of the planet was. All I know is about where it is. Um, but it's beautiful. Is it like Earth? Um, yeah, yeah. And it's got water, uh, waterfalls, grass, mountains. Yeah, wow. it's beautiful. What is the, what is the mode of, of transportation that they use on that planet? Um, they use these small... Small ships, let's put it that way. Uh, like uh, one or two of the ones that, that you might see with uh, Billy Meyer, but they're not quite shaped like that. Um, they, they buzz around. They don't really have highways mm-hmm. around there. They just, they just buzz around, go somewhere, and they land. And yeah. Go off and go off to another place. You mentioned Billy Meyer. <laughs> what, uh, yeah. you know... There, there, you know, his his case is quite filled with controversy. Uh, I've had the pleasure of talking to Michael Horn a great number of times. I've met Michael. Um, what is your take on the Meyer case? Well, let me put it this way. They have tried many, many times to debunk him. Right. In some of his photos and videos, they never could do it. They even used a, uh, you probably know this, they even used a, Make, uh, makeshift, they, they built one that was like about maybe uh, a foot long or a foot wide, and they put it out on the string, mm-hmm. like a uh, uh, fishing line, right. and they would kind of move it around and, and then took a video and stuff like that, and they took a picture of that and also the, the one, the real UFO, put them side by side and tried to analyze them and tear them down. Billy Myers' photos, they could not the one they made, it was just torn all to pieces. Now, the, the ETs that, that you uh, work with on board the battleship, are they the same ETs that 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 uh, that make themselves known to Billy? Uh, no. The ones that, that I work with are vegans, uh, 
they're they're called vegans mm-hmm. and they're reptilian and uh, those are the ones I work with and uh, their planet matter of fact is 756 miles 56 uh, 756 million light years away which would be in a different Galaxy. Yeah, the the reptilians have a bad uh, uh, reputation here with a number of the the contactees, a- and it seems that you work with them on board the battleship. Is the is the reputation that the reptilians have all wrong? There are several different types of of reptilians around here. The ones I work with are helping to to keep Earth in our galaxy. That's it. Along with a couple other different species. And there are other um, types that try to manipulate somebody to come on board. You know, hey, come on, we'd like you. You know, you're yeah. you're human and you're good. You know, and, uh, come on, we'll have some dinner. And you're the dinner. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, you know, we try to keep them away from humans as much as possible, which we do, in uh, other other planets as well on, 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 this, on this galaxy. And uh, it's, it's, it's rough. It's, try, it's pretty rough to keep everything on the up and up and uh, keep the bad boys away. Let me ask you this, Chuck. How does it, um, how has your knowledge, having worked and still working with the the ETs aboard the battleship, you go away for six days. You've got a daughter, um, you know, on the other side of the Pleiades. So you know for a fact that UFOs are real. How does this affect the way in which you conduct a UFO investigation for MUFON? Uh, it, it does not bother me uh, because. When I do the investigations, I, I read exactly what the people um, are saying about what took place when they saw this, their, their ship or mm-hmm. their, their, their object, if you will. And uh, some of them are just regular uh, orange, number white. Some of them are a, a beautiful blue, which turns white and black to blue and stuff. Um, when we investigate this, I check everything feasible, whether it be a star, whether mm-hmm. it be um, uh, a, a drone, or anything like this. I mean, I, I really get into the specifics of of investigation, investigating uh, some of these cases, and um, then you find out that uh, you know we really don't know what it is, so we put it in a UAV, and which is the uh, unknown aerial. Instead of, we, instead of us saying a UFO, we say uh, unknown aerial maybe. And, uh, you know, but here, here you are, Chuck. You've actually gone up in these craft. You, you've gone on, let me see, uh, on voyages, light years of travel, and you know here, and you're asked to investigate a UFO, or you know that people call UFOs who don't have the experience that you have. Um, why are, why are these sightings not being taken more seriously? And, and you know how do you how do you leave from planet Earth, go to a, a ship that is somewhere near Pluto, without being detected? <laughs> the 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 ships are not detected that far away, mostly, and unless you have a powerful powerful. Um, Telescope? Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, it, it, it's, it's kind of like 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 my video camera. The other day, well, after this, maybe three weeks ago, um, I had to, to let the cat out. Mm-hmm. She won't get up. And this was like five thirty in the morning. Right. And uh, so I looked up and I saw the morning star, which would be serious. So. I, I, I grabbed my camera, went in there, and zoomed in on it. And then, boy, I'll tell you what, that was some photo or some video I got of that night. It was beautiful. And uh, 
my elbow slipped, so I had to redo it. And I saw something just up to the right side of it, on the upper, upper right side of it. I said, what the heck is that? So I zoomed in on that, and lo and behold, it was a huge, huge UFO. And it had red, green, blue uh, uh, lights and everything flashing. It was just sitting there. And I backed away from it. I zoomed in again, and then it took off. But it, was, it only got maybe just a few seconds of it. But I still saw it. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. You know, and uh, so I, just, I kind of was telling everybody about it, and I even showed a few people of it you know, when we go to meetings. But I have meetings every month, and uh, it helps keep the aspect of sightings and, uh, and I would say, uh, intriguing people that want to know what's going on up there and even though they've never seen anything they may they may not um they, they may say we don't know what's up there but we would like to find out what and, do what do your other members of MUFON say about your you know you're going all over the place in this in this battleship or this battle cruiser and, you know, the fact that you have a daughter on the other side of the Pleiades, it, it, you know, how do they react to that? They reacted to it with enthusiasm, um, which kind of surprised me in a sense, because mm-hmm. they had told them, when I first told them about me going up and uh, what was going on, and they were they all kinds of questions. Um, how, how did you do that, then? And how did you get to go on board and so on and so forth? Yeah. And uh, I keep getting, I keep getting from them. Um, I want to go. I want to go on on a, on a cruise. I want to mm-hmm. just go have an experience. And I said, well, I'll see what I can do. I, all I can do is just tell them that you would like to go. And uh, from there, it's it's up to them. It's not up to me. Does the uh, mm-hmm. does the commander of the ship ever allow other members of Mufon to go on the ship with them? Um, there was one, yes, uh, he doesn't remember it, but yes, he was there. Mm-hmm. He was one of our, uh, big directors, basically. At the time, I think he was our, uh, state director, I'm not right. sure. And, uh, and, but he was taken up and he didn't realize, he didn't, he, he just didn't know about it because they didn't want him, I guess, to, uh, a lot of times they don't want people to know exactly what's going on. They may have a just a quick look mm-hmm. at something and let them have a quick look at something. And then maybe if you think about it and, you know, okay, was I up there, was I not? Um, chances are you may get the gist of what actually took place and you can see where you were. How do the how do the the extraterrestrials that you work with on board this ship? How do they feel about you telling people about the work that you do with the ETs? And you know, how do they feel about you telling people outside of the circle that you have a daughter? They don't mind it at all. Wow. As a matter of fact, they they, they implore me to put the uh, word out there that. that that I work with them, and, mm-hmm. and this is what I do on board, and so on and so forth. Um, but as far as my daughter goes, that was something on my own, and uh, they didn't care if I did or not say it, because it was up to me at the time. And uh, so I decided to go ahead and pass the word out. Just that simple. I'm not afraid to talk about all right. this stuff, because it's very real. Do you, do you have any pictures of your daughter? I wish I did, but I won't. they're not allowing me to do that. Oh, do you have yeah. any? Do you did you bring anything back that you can keep as, uh, as a memento, fr- but from your daughter? Um, you know, like my kids, my girls, and my son when they were small, 
they would draw pictures or they would make me something. And, you know, I, I still have a lot of this, many of the, of the things that the children gave me over the years, as well as now my grandchildren. And I cherish them. It, does she do anything for you? Yeah, she does. Uh, she draws things. She, she, she plays. We color and this and that, but it all stays on board ship or that there, there is it. Um, right now, uh, I'm not allowed to take anything from the ship to Earth, um, especially, mm-hmm. especially the, um, uh, what do you call the uh, electronic stuff? <laughs> they just don't want that released yet in time it will be it will be known um, and I will be able to uh, bring something down and show the group and stuff and and, uh, and take pictures of it and then bring it back up there all right, Chuck, please stand by we've got to take our final break for this hour XO nation our very special guest this hour is um, Chuck Stansberg. He is the MUFON State Section 12 Director, STAR Team member. He's a CAG member and a field investigator. For more information on MUFON, www.mufon.com. And Chuck and I will be back on the other side of this break as we wrap up this hour here in the x from our broadcast center in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. Don't go away. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at songsandstoriesforsoldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. I am Dr. Carl O'Helvey, founder, president of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence-based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. You're listening to the X Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. If you enjoy reading a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love From Out of the Woodwork by William S. Peckham. Sean Kennedy, a Toronto contractor, buys derelict houses, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, a century house in ruins, and starts the renovation, the house fights back. He is visited by ghosts of owners past. His visions are triggered by touching an oak mantle, reading a faded letter, opening an old locket, or opening a brand new casket in the basement. These visions will take you on a trip across southern Ontario from Niagara Falls to Toronto to Kingston. From Out of the Woodwork is now available in paperback and on your favorite electronic reader. To order your copy of From Out of the Woodwork, go to www.williamspeckham.com. That's www.williamspeckham.com. You're listening to the X-Zone Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net.
Welcome back, everyone. Chuck Stansberg is our special guest of this hour. He is with MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network. For more information on MUFON, if you'd like to report a UFO, if you'd like to join MUFON, www.mufon.com. First of all, Chuck, great having you back on the show. Always a pleasure talking to you. And uh, you people at MUFON do so much great work. Um, please, my very best to all your people in uh, in your MUFON group. Thank you. Chuck, why do why are cattle being mutilated? Well, sometimes that's a pretty good question. But when they take certain parts, I'm not sure if they're actually trying to recreate an animal. Mm-hmm. Or, or uh, I know they take. Uh, sometimes they will take the uh, the reproductive organs, um, and to me, that's what they're doing. is probably cloning. To, that way, they can have as much meat as they want instead mm-hmm. of taking it from us down here on Earth. Um, we had one uh, mutilation of sheep in uh, in, in, in in our state here, in 2013, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it was Port Lavaca, and uh, the gentleman lost a bunch of sheep, and we went down there and checked it all out. And, uh, of course, the way it was all set up, it was just the same the same part of the neck that has a slit in it that cattle have, the sheep head as well. And uh, their, the, the female's part, their, their belly was cut open, laid back, the belly was taken out, and the reproductive organs were taken. Nothing else. Hmm. And people were trying to say, that, well, that was predators. Well, predators don't know how to do surgery. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> and and the, the male part, the male sheep, they took their genitals, and they did the same thing on the, on the neck. So, yes, it's, it's, I think, to me, I'm not sure why they're doing it, but I, to, to me, it's, sounds like, or it feels like that they are uh, cloning these types of animals so they'll have plenty of meat for themselves. Makes sense. My final question for you, Chuck, we've got about a minute and a half here. Why the truth embargo on UFOs? That, my friend, is a very big question. I have no idea why they're doing it. Um, but the people right now, with people like myself and others, mm-hmm. that are spreading the word and actually and seeing actual UFOs and stuff, are starting to learn that why are they trying to have the embargo on this, on this stuff when they're real, yeah. when they're really out there. And especially when people have been uh, abducted or, uh, as myself, uh, learned to to live with them and and, mm-hmm. and and work with them, which is amazing to me, and it's always amazing whenever I go. Chuck, I want to thank you ever so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for sharing your your amazing story, and I look forward to the next time you and I meet back here in the X Zone. So until then, take care of yourself, Chuck. I will, and thank you very much. I appreciate it. Pleasure's all mine. I will, my friend. Exo Nation, Chuck Stansberg has been our guest this hour. For more information on UFOs, if you'd like to report a UFO, www.mufon.com. That's it for tonight. I'll be back tomorrow night at 8 o'clock as once again we cross the time-space continuum to this place that I call the Exo. So until tomorrow night, remember, Exo Nation, always keep your eyes to the sky and your heart to the light. Good night now.